We got a lot of hate comments down there. <laughs> This is a follow-up video about the removable SSD storage for the Apple Silicon MacBooks and it seems that we need to make this video because there's too much confusion and chaos in the comment section. So bear with us until we answer all of your top questions here. So the first question is, can't decide if it's legit due to the Comic Sans font. Well, it's not about Comic Sans, it's about sending a message. But honestly, the font setting is always chalkboard and it's quite sad that it looks so much like Comic Sans. Anyway, am I the only one watched the whole video and somehow miss how to actually do it? To understand how to actually do it, we need to go back to the basics of how the storage NANs are connected. As we all know, the two NANs are nicely soldered here making them unremovable. So if you desolder or remove both of the NANs, you will see the NAN lending pads underneath them. So each NAND is connected to these organized pins, then if you count the pins then you will find that it has 110 pins, and that is why it is known as BGA110. So each NAND is connected to their respective landing pads with these 110 pins or wires or we can say transmission line. So the main puzzle is how do we make these storage NANDs removable? Well, as you saw in the previous video, we simply place an M.2 connector at the center of these transmission lines. So the next main challenge is how are you gonna cram all these 210 20 wires to this single M.2 port. And to cut it short, we successfully did it by systematically grouping the power and signals according to their class to the M.2 port. So by having this M.2 port, we all know the removable SSD NAND is possible. But right now, we have another problem. Even though we were able to group the wires to this M.2 port, all these transmission lines are still clustered in mass. So you have to fix the mass on the logic board side, and of course you also need to fix the mass on the NAND side. And that brings us to the next question. Nice solution, but we only see the result. It would be nice to see how it's made. Good question. So obviously we need to make or create something to systematically reroute each of these clustered wires. So to organize the logic board side, you need a single printed circuit board or PCB to reroute all these 220 wires to the M.2 port. This is the base PCB you saw in the previous video that reorganizes the transmission lines from the logic board to the M.2 port. So one problem down, then you need to solve the NAND side too, and hence we created another carrier PCB to directly connect the M.2 port to the two NANDs. Then a little bit of rearrangement will give you this. And that brings us to the next question. So you guys say no soldering but clearly the bottom board needs to be soldered, right? Well, we wrote a caption that says no micro soldering required after the first modification. But maybe the caption is just too small. Anyway, yes, the first PCB is required to be soldered to the logic board obviously because it has to extract all the landing pad spins to reroute the wires to the M.2 port. Then the M.2 port is soldered to the top side of this base PCB and it usually can be done in the PCB factory. The full video on how to solder this base adapter to the logic board will be uploaded when we finally start small scale production sometime in December 2024, so make sure to stay subscribed. Now, some of you might think, ah, this guy is just trying to make easy money by selling cheap adapters to the public. What a shame! And that brings us to the next question How did you get the idea to pull this off? What do you need to know to design such PCB? So, to be able to pull this off successfully, the PCB we design must follow the strict guidelines and meet the design constraints as they communicate using the PCIe protocol. Thus it means that you have to learn a new engineering topic and yes, it certainly does help if you graduated with electronic engineering degree so you can easily understand the lessons from Professor Eric Bogatin, a signal integrity evangelist at Teledyne LaCroix. You can enroll in his online class or even buy his book about signal and power integrity simplified. I really recommend you to buy this book and read it. And Professor Eric Bogatin is the person that would call all these 110 wires as transmission lines, doesn't matter whether it's a power or a signal line or the return plane. There are four important principles. The first is all interconnects are transmission lines, period. All it takes is a signal and a return path. Unfortunately, we sometimes call the return path ground. It doesn't matter what the DC voltage is. All that's important is proximity. So there's signal and return path. Every, trans every interconnect is a transmission line. Then you need to learn what is a differential pair, what is the trace length, trace width, trace spacing, and what is FR4 material, dielectric constant, and what is their relation with impedance, then how to measure the impedance using time domain reflectometry or TDR. And when you finish that, then we recommend you to watch all videos by Rick Hartley, a principal engineer for circuit board design and development. When you have a long rise time compared to propagation time, 
In other words, in a lumped element circuit, the energy in the transmission line... Where he explained about EMI, noise reduction, PCB routing optimization, poor or not to poor. And when you finish that, then I suggest you to binge watch Robert Frenak videos, all his podcasts and experiment with Eric Bogatin. And so in the forward direction, we have a positive voltage burst that's moving back. And in the forward direction, we have a negative then cross-check what you learned so far by watching Zach Peterson's video from Ultium Academy channel and digest how you need to consider the far end crosstalk or FEX. And that is what's going to allow the far end crosstalk to cancel. So does that always happen? Then see how it differs with near end crosstalk or next. We actually see that near end crosstalk does not depend on the rise time then maybe learn how to route differential pairs on two-layer PCBs or four-layer PCB and wait until he says, don't forget to call your fabricator. All right, thanks everybody, and don't forget to call your fabricator. And the list can go on and on and on if you want me to keep going. And I hope you understand what I explained so far, then it's time to go to Apple Schematics and find a design constraint page. And you can see here that Apple uses 85 ohm impedance to route the differential pairs. So your job is to design a transmission line to match this 85 ohm impedance so that the PCIe data is not bounced back or reflected. So this is the route we went through to design such PCB for this project. But why do you need to know and understand all of this critical information? Is it really that important? And that brings us to the next question. Actually, what about signal integrity? What is the speed those digital lanes operate? This comment is the actual reason why the whole study is critical. Signal integrity. One of the biggest factors affecting the signal integrity is the trace length. If you have a longer trace length, then it is more likely that the signal integrity will degrade, meaning that a non-connected 10 cm away has much better signal integrity than the ones connected at 30 cm away. So we decided to measure the non-distance to the M1 Pro CPU of the 16-inch MacBook Pro, and we approximately get a minimum of 19.8 cm trace length for the differential pairs. Next, let's have our modified M1 MacBook into the scene, and the total approximate distance from the M1 CPU plus adapter plus to the NANs is only 12.9 cm. Still a lot shorter than the 16 inch MacBook Pros, so theoretically and technically, this adapter will work just fine. The digital lanes on these NANs operate at PCIe 4.0 speed, as each NAN is only connected to the M1 via PCIe X1 to give you a speed of 1500 MB per second for each NAN. So the total speed for RAID 0 NANs will be around plus minus 3000 MB per second for read and write like what we tested before. If your PCB design is bad, you will never ever get this kind of stable speed for the NANs. This is the speed for 2TB SSD size, then of course, in order for the PCB to be this stable, you need to study the PCIe 2.0 electromechanical specifications, then PCIe 3.0, followed by PCIe 4.0 electromechanical specifications and all related documents for PCB design, and only then we were able to create all these Mac modification kits on our Tindy page. And honestly, we are lucky to have a MacBook repair shop that allows us to test the signal integrity knowledge from hands-on experience that turns into these projects. And thank you to Raul, Niraj, Michael, and everyone for leaving great feedback here. And thank you to all folks spotting this project from day one. And some of these projects were also featured in Dos Dudes YouTube channel. So make sure to check them out. Thank you for your awesome videos, bro. And to answer Mr. Omar the Pablo question, will this adapter work in my iMac 2020 27 inch? Well, the iMac 2020 will only work with this Nevbolt 3 adapter. And it's available now if you need to add a secondary NVMe storage inside the very last 27 inch iMac released in 2020. Of course, you're gonna need to solder it for the first time. Then you just need to to buy the third-party NVMe storage like Samsung SSD and it will be a removable SSD forever. And that brings us to the next question. Wow, great idea to make it removable. One question, can you make it work with classic NVMe drives? As what we explained earlier, this M.2 port was hardwired to fit these 220 wires. So in order to achieve this target, we don't have any choice but to assign custom pins to this M.2 port and hence a normal NVMe drive you can find in the PC market will not work and we will not be responsible if you still want to try it and something bad happens. The reason we chose this M.2 connector is simply because it is cheap and widely available for you to replace it yourself and it is supposed to be compliant with PCIe 4.0. And actually, we already did another project to fit a third-party NVMe to the M1 Pro MacBook Pro. But it turns out to be impractical because the speed is really slow and not worth for us to continue the project. So do not wait for it. And that brings us to the next question. 
how long until update comes along which complains about non-genuine storage or worse prevents the laptop from booting at all. Since we are dealing with original NANs from Kyoxia, then the M1 SoC will never know if this alien circuit board even exists because this PCB is just a bunch of wires organized to make a passive PCB. Next question, do you have to restore it every time you change it? If you have an SSD with macOS already on it, the short answer is yes. Every time you change it, you need to perform the FU restore because somehow your files inside the NANs are encrypted to your M1 CPU. This has something to do with the secure enclave, iBoot 2 etc and we don't want to go too deep for now. So yeah, this modification is only for replacing the dead NANs easily for now and it's quite sad that it is useless for data recovery now until someone will be able to crack this up. And that brings us to the next question. Why not just solder the 2TB to begin with if soldering is required to begin with for this mod? 100% of people do not need removable storage. They just want high storage to begin with. Well, honestly, we don't want to answer this question because some of you will definitely think that we just want to sell our PCB adapter. And you might even say that we are biased. So I will let Mr. Dante Metaphor to answer this question. Storage dies. There is a reason every professional product has removable storage. Cameras, audio recorders, desktop PCs, heck even the Mac Studio has removable storage. Just because you don't need it doesn't mean nobody does. Well, Mr. Dante Metaphor has a point. And even the new M4 Mac Mini has a removable storage. So maybe Apple admits that removable storage is convenient and their technicians can easily replace their SSDs, right? So they don't need to change the whole logic board anymore. For that reason, we actually created a poll to let the end users answer this question themselves. You can still answer this poll by the way. Just go to the community tab on our profile and vote for the answer so that Apple will see the result. If you have a 2TB storage MacBook as the end user or consumer, do you still prefer it to be removable or non-removable? I'm not sure why YouTube is bad at math, but right now you can see here 90% says that they still prefer it to be removable. Only 3% want it to be non-removable and the rest of 8% don't even care. Well, it seems the 90% says that the fact that you can change the storage means that you can change it if something goes wrong. And they used to have removable storage on the old MacBooks. Working in a repair shop, we would constantly see the old MacBook Airs coming in with bad SSDs. Well, apparently what they said is true. And another person said that I would buy a modded used M1 MacBook for the price of a brand new one. And I would love this for my 2020 M1 Air. I have 500 gigs at the moment, but it would be awesome to be able to chuck in one or two terabyte when the time comes. So yeah, this modification actually gives you freedom to choose what capacity you need and you don't have to worry about that storage again. Great, is this available to buy from you? Yes, the upgrade kit will be available on our Tindy store sometime in December, so stay tuned. The next comment says, what series of M chip motherboard did you work on M1, M2, M3 and does it work on all three series? Well, right now our focus is on releasing the PCB for the M1 Mac Mini, MacBook Pro and MacBook Air. And only then, we will tell you what is our plan for the newer 14-inch and 16-inch MacBooks. You guys are amazing. Please keep this up and we will support you as much as we can. Thank you Megatron's kneecap. And thank you for all the awesome name suggestions. Ainan Max, Nevermind, Lul, Miknan, Sidestore, Xnan, and all the others. Just keep them coming. And to end this video, we want you to ponder these comments that look like a joke but it's actually not. Apple's next move, we're going to serialize our soldered SSDs so the MacBook won't boot up without the original SSD. Well, the bad news is they already did it to your Wi-Fi chip on the M1 MacBooks and later. This PCIe Wi-Fi IC is serialized and paired to your M1 SoC. So if your Wi-Fi IC dies from liquid damage which is quite common, you won't be able to replace it even using Wi-Fi ICs from another M1 donor board. And it's so common that the community documented the workaround on the LogiWiki page. We will put it in the description link. Next comment says, storage will come sorted to the chip now. Well, it would be a nightmare if they start to solder the storage next to the SOC. Just like how they hard soldered the LPDDR4X RAM next to the M1 silicon die. I seriously hope they will never do this because it's going to be really, really, really bad. And the last comment from Mr. <laughs> Let me know if I can be of any assistance to you. I work for a large tool leather company. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. I know all of you folks are awesome. So make sure to subscribe and see you again at iBoff RCC channel, reverse engineering at its best. Thanks for watching and have a nice day.